Okay, good. I want to start off that way. I can see it. I only see your thoughts, right? Yes. <laughs> Ridiculous. Okay, Ron, I'll let you decide when we start. Yeah, one minute. One minute. Bunch of people going to Dublin. I'm sorry? A bunch of people. A bunch of people in our little project are heading off to Dublin oh. for a hack session. Okay, that's pretty fun. Never seen it. Okay, I think the live stream's gone live. Well, I think our live stream is live. Um, oh, and it says recording. Good. So, our speaker today is Steve Wallach from Micron. Um, Steve has got so many things he's done over so many decades that I don't want to spend an hour just talking about Steve, so I'll keep it quick. Any of you who are in his business in the 80s know about the book Soul of a New Machine, and Steve pairs there, and there was some very innovative work on a processor called Fountainhead, I believe was the correct name. Um, Steve started uh, Convex in 89, is my memory. 82. 82? Whoa, that was, Okay. Uh, we bought a Convex C1 when I was in Maryland in uh, 88. It was a very wonderful machine. Uh, HP later bought Convex. Uh, then Steve started an FPGA computing company called Convey because Y comes after X. And that was bought by Micron, and Steve is now engineering director. En engineering director at Micron. And, um, you know, he's forgotten more about computer architecture than I'll ever know. And he's here today to talk about the RISC-V 128. Um, take it away. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Before I... <laughs> okay, just ring in. Okay. Uh, let me just give you some motivation uh, for what this is before we get going. And also, I would encourage you, if anyone has a question, please stop. I like this to be as interactive as possible. Um, for a long time, I've been thinking about referencing memory. What does it mean? Is something other than uh, physical address. Um, uh, in 1980 or so, I got involved, as uh, Ron pointed out, a project called Fountainhead, which was uh, kind of a spinoff of a lot of stuff that was developed by MIT in Multics. Uh, that didn't go anyplace because the technology wasn't ready then, too expensive to implement it. And in the last five, six years, through a combination of some motivation by various people who said, why don't you give it another try? And more and more physical memory. And now we have clusters and we like to have global addressing across clusters, at least some do, et cetera. And uh, part of this was done for the risk v organization. And Mike, uh, Google is, is, some people in Google play an active part in, in that organization. And its objectives is simple to develop an ISA and technology that's open source. So whoever wants to build to it, builds it, and there's no issue of patents and stuff like that. At least that's my understanding. And I establish what's called an SV128 working group. And uh, pretty much everything you see is uh, I develop. And with that as an intro, we're going to get going. Okay, um, I like to walk around. I hope the, this picks it up. I have a remote thing. Okay, the presentation's in actually, uh, there's four parts to it. And I wanna give some background from a, just a technology perspective. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of this stuff was done 40, 50 years ago. There's probably people in this audience who are not old enough to even remember this, let alone read. So a lot of it is just as a basis what I call a full proposal, and then in a more rational moment, what it means. Okay, uh, the boss man says everyone should mute. Uh, uh, how do you do that? Oh, no. We just had the discussion of custom. I don't know how to do that. Just tap him, his presentation. Yeah, it's ready on present to all. I think. Oh, okay. there we go. Okay. Thank you. So um, 
you can see how uh, I kind of divide the presentation into three parts. And we'll go from there. As a motivation, I always like to know why, why should one do this? And this was a, an excellent presentation by uh, Stan Williams, so I got to know a little bit at HP. And you know, every, every, almost every presentation on process of design and architecture talks about the end of Moore's law cycles. I'm, I'm not gonna bore you with that. But what is interesting is where the model of compute was in the upper right, I'm sorry, I can't, which is uh, more processor centric. And it's really moved to a more memory centric view. That is meaning this is an open architecture and these are the various ISAs that surround it. So it will be heterogeneous computing. That's another pictorial way of, gener of heterogeneous computing. And if one wants to achieve that, let's assume this is desirable. Well, you want pointers to pass pointers back and forth. And we kind of have a de facto pointer in this business also, in the sense right now a 64-bit byte address numbered from right to left. Almost every architecture that anyone uses has that particular pointer. So what are the objectives? Uh, well, one may think about a bigger address space to addressing more memory. The real thing is also to add security. You know, I always was a big to do about security for various and sundry reasons. I find it very interesting, very challenging. And these days, you know, once a month, once a week, you read about some hack about security, whatever it may be. Uh, so I want to address some of those issues. Address exascale computing. When I got to know Ron at Los Alamos, what they try to do is have one byte for every peak flop. So if I have an exaflop, I want an exabyte, assuming you can afford it. Well, that's 60 bits. That's getting pretty close to 64. So if you want to start a new project going for the next de decade or two, this is not rocket science. You've got to be able to address more than uh, 64 bits. And if we don't do that, to use a frame, uh, once I met Gene Amdahl, some of you may or may not know who he is. And when he built the Amdahl 470, he had 360 emulation. And I asked him, did he ever think of supporting 7th, uh, 1401 or 7040 emulation? And he came out with one of the best lines. He goes, sometimes the son should not deal with the sins of their parents and grandparents. And that's the key thing. Some point it takes guts to break and go forward with something new as opposed to keep saying, well, we got to support this. We got to support. Now, you still have to support it. I'm not saying you don't. But at some point, you got to break it. So therefore, my view is we can begin to design a secure, programmable, exabyte, zettabyte distributed memory system. That's how I'm going to evaluate things. Also, I am still a computer designer. I view the best benchmark is the one your competition cannot run. And I know about that. A of I, if, if I is 16 bits, but you have 32 bits, you can't run it. So that at Data General and other places. So to bring it down to reality. OK, the background, um, you can read this about what happened in the 70s, all the computer manufacturers basically, uh, and today increased their address spaces or physical address spaces from 16 to 32 to 64, primarily because there was, oops, sorry, more physical memory. Now, what just happened about a month ago is Intel with Sandy Cove increased their address space from 48, that is what they actually interpret, from 48 to 57. Now, a lot of people go, how do you get a 57-bit virtual address space? Well, the answer is easy. A 4KB page size, which is 12 bits, page table entries that are 8 bytes, which is 9 bits, 5 times 9 plus 12. So here's one thing. Do we want to continue with that? And if we have a flat address space, do we want to wake up one day and have an eight level page? No, I'm yeah. You speak to some people who go, but 
but we would have to change the OS kernel or we have to, I'm not making this up. Oh, believe me, I know. <laughs> okay. Thank you. By the way, I haven't paid him anything to laugh or giggle at some things. Okay. So further background. Now, while everyone was increasing the address space, a lot of people said, let's take a whole different perspective. And this was IBM did FS, which ultimately became the AS400. Data Journal was the FHP, Intel with the 432. And they basically all failed in one way or another. I'm not gonna go into the details, but there was a lot of research and technology. What's the research? There was Multix at MIT, Project Genie at Berkeley, and its major impact was influence industry. And a lot of people don't realize that Unix is a diminutive of Multix. That's when Dennis and Ritchie said, this is too big too cumbersome. So let's simplify it. And the simplification uh, Unix meant was for Multics. And so there's an example of sometimes you got to go overboard to see what makes sense to actually ship. And needless to say, that changed the whole industry. Going forward, again, you can read it. I want to go from 64 to 128. Um, we have to also make our addressing network wide. 30, 40 years ago, we, we never thought about that. It was just what was local disk. Now we've gone to cluster wide and one can argue it should be network wide. Why should we have two different address structures if I go out on the network or local? Because every time you do that, you add more software and, and, and potential security breaches. Now, uh, the risk five people, Christie doesn't like when I put this up, but he wrote this, that he believes we're going to argue about all these things and segments and objects, but ultimately go to a flat address space. That's a quote. I'm not, what we'll, and we're now, let's say, in that discussion point. Okay. Every once in a while, I use Dilbert to my, as an advisor to help me get going. So from Dilbert's perspective on this is China International Data Security Standards Group. Uh, the goal, you can read it. Let us, t and you can read the joke. Let us take pride in being independent from the companies that fund us. And what's interesting about this is, first of all, it's tr somewhat true. And the ones who will really make the changes where they're funding it themselves or their own company. They're not based on NSF, DOP, or, or, or other type funding organizations. Okay, let's do some simple things. Most people don't realize, or they realize it, just don't think about, that a virtual address doesn't really reference physical memory. It references storage. That's CS101. That's why in hardware we have things like TLBs, et cetera. Uh, network addressing is already 128 bits. It's IPv6. Give credit to the communication guys. They took the big step and uh, it's there. We actually live in a world of uniqueness. Mac and URLs are unique. Email addresses is unique. We have a global phone number system. But we have two different addressing structures, whether it's local or global, and please take this the right way. Every time I see more software in the systems I design, it gets slower and less secure. This is from a hardware guy. So what if we can have one unified structure? So let's see what that means. Foundational basis. You can read this. Um, this is from a paper published in 1971 by Butler Lamson, who was you know, clearly one of the was there a lot of credit for establishing the basis for security research. So here we have these objectives we are just as relevant today that were established 50 years ago for all practical purposes. Other foundational basis, again, I'm not gonna read it. Probably the most interesting observation is that the objective of security is to prevent unauthorized use of information, a negative kind of requirement. Usually we think of a positive type of requirement, not a negative. 
you can read it again and also validity and authenticity is required and th this is again a paper from 1975 by schroeder salzer and the two of them together at multics you know this is considered probably the most seminal paper you know broad-based in, in the area of security etc okay previous efforts uh this is from ibm it was actually took some effort to get that paper it was inside an IBM library and a friend of mine used to work at IBM was able to get it. I mean, it's, it's not confidential or anything. It's just, it's not exactly available if you don't know the right people. And they created some notion of uniqueness. He has some references, some patents that I've been involved with. Capability is another version, February in 1974. And of course, that's what the ARM people are doing, you know, with Cambridge and stuff like that. Sherry, we'll talk a little bit about that. The IBM paper, for those who want it, is this one. It's very, very interesting. They, that actually was what FS was supposed to be before they canceled it. Okay. More contemporary, Opal came out of uh, University of Washington. And... They establish, I'm, what I'm trying to do is give you some reasons for doing this, as opposed to just saying, here you go. That's very important. Notions of persistent pointers. You can read that 64 bits is not good enough if you want it for all global network. So unfortunately, a lot of people are still looking at clusters of phones. You know, a lot of their motivation is not clusters of systems. And a friend of mine taking this one step further, maybe it's now clusters of watches. So a lot of the effort is on this guy for a lot of the software rather than necessarily server class software, other than Google, since I'm equipment, let me make sure I say that. Okay, here's now, if I was doing this from scratch, I would do 120 bit address space, tell you what the, uh, instructions are and then this leads once i got this out of the way of what it means to go rational to just use 96 bits day one the reason it's 96 bits is my unix kernel guy say the current version of linux at the kernel basically has a 96 bit virtual address space of proc id va so it knows how to deal with that it takes us all the all these process tables and moves it into a system-wide table uh, i see some nods so that's how I move into it rather than with a sledgehammer, but gradually. So logical address space is 128 bits, object ID byte offset. This is always the most controversial thing. If it's, if one wants flat, that doesn't exist. So the question is, do we want to bifurcate the address space? And there are good reasons for both. I'm not saying there's no good reasons. But lately, even within the Linux world with something which we call Kaiser, they're beginning to say for security, you really have to bifurcate the address space. Object ID in 128 bits is unique. And we'll talk about how we get there. Indexing is A of I, I is 64 bits. But each operand could be an object. So it's not like you're limited. What that means is you can only index to um, six, 16 exabytes as a single index. And you, in this whole presentation, you're not going to hear me talk about instruction sets. This is ISA dependent. So this would map onto what Stan Williams showed as a memory centric model of compute going forward. A crit persistent across time and space, et cetera. Okay, motivations, we need better security. We need computer virtual addressing to reflect contemporary uses. We do not want flat 128-bit address space, in my opinion, et cetera, et cetera. We need authentication. And eventually, I'm going to lead to very detailed specifications. I just want to provide my motivation. What's a name? An object can be an application, a database, a store, a PCAST node. So to the extent I understand the way Google does things, you have all these millions of nodes, but you have some sort of pseudo global address space to go from one node to another. So that here, you would put this in the hardware, not just 
software interpretation. And you have languages which today support it, like UPC, et cetera. People always say, is 64 bits enough? Just what shows you what happens if, if you have a, a new object every second of the day. I'm gonna skip this, okay. Before I get into the details now, each object has its own memory management structure in terms of page table, hash industry, indices, et cetera. What that means is, and we'll get to this when we do hypervisor, virtual machine management, one object could be a page table, one object could be hashed, and depending on the object, you choose which one is appropriate. And it, memory management protection is independent. There's no protection bits associated with memory management. Each object also does bounds check. And we'll talk about how that manifests itself. Protection in the unified namespace, you have to have ACLs, access controllers, protection domains, revocation. Now, I'm not claiming this is unique. I'm just saying these are the steps that if you're going to have an integrated system, you want to have. So an ACL is basically a matrix where you have source name, target, and domain of execution. And then that determines what protection you have inside. So in a true glorious 128-bit address space, you have this table with hashing 364-bit numbers, et cetera, which is very cumbersome. It's not clear. It's you, you, you need it. But what we want to do is this define sphere as a protection, non-hierarchical, emphasize non-hierarchical, unlike rings. Some of the things, permissions, uh, I'm going to show you how I do all this thing and what I'm really proposing. One of the things that's important is to mediate system calls also. Because I may bring something into my object, in, into my system, a.out file, that makes a system call that it shouldn't be made. So it's not just read, write, protect, but other things, et cetera. OK, authentication, it's unique over time and space. Yada, 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 I want to get to what I'm really, to the real thing. Okay, this is just using an application. Let me, I want to, okay. The other thing, and I get into the details, is I want to provide hardware support for sandboxing. So when I bring an application in, the user can determine what accesses it have and can restrict it. The principle of least privilege. Revocation. And this is where we'll ultimately get into capabilities versus uh, domains. Uh, no matter how you, whatever the protection mechanism you have, you want to provide a way of revoking it. If it's table-based, the kernel goes to the table and flips a bit. If it's a capability, you have to have some way in memory of saying capabilities are only in this space and not in other space and they, they tag bits. So this is what was done initially in Fabree, and at least the last paper I looked at from Sherry, that's the way they did it. They separate the address spaces. And this is a quote right from Fabree where they tag memory, it's called the partition approach to separate what's a capability. Okay, so I went through all this, I got it out of my system. Now I'm ready, when am I gonna lay gates? When I mean lay gates, if someone said, put a plan together, start designing in a month, they'd have that done. So uh, we gratefully thank our parents and grandparents, and we want a second chance. So here's the second chance. Okay, here's the current proposal. So this is actually based on SV128 for RISC-V. And there's a working group. This has been published in there, et cetera. So, RISC-V defines this notion, and I, this is literally right from the ISA spec, that they have user, supervisor, reserve, machine, or hypervisor. So they want the architecture to make sure it works in that and knows at least three protection structures. So what I just 
So what we're trying to do is to say what makes sense with a bigger address space, but also maps the Linux kernel to some degree. Without, without saying, I give up and not going to do anything innovative. So first of all, I create four domains, not an infinite number. And the four domains match to, to that. The next thing is, I have, a, and I'll describe what I mean by a personal domain for sandboxing. It's a 96-bit address space rather than 128. As I mentioned, the reason I say 96 is because the current Linux kernel basically is a 96-bit interpretive address space. I provide capability from RRV 32 and 64. That's RISC-V definition of 32-bit address space, 64-bit address space. And I have separate logical to physical translations per object. What this is right from the spec, this is the way uh, it's implemented on IA64. And I'm sure when I tell you this, you shouldn't be surprised that the IA64 drives a lot of what's in Linux and the architecture. And this is why in meetings say, oh, we can't do it this way because Linux on an IA64 does it that way. Now, the fact it was done that way 15 years ago, I'm not saying it was the right decision 50 years ago. It's not sure it's the right decision today. Of anything that I say today, that's the one thing I want to make sure it gets across. So what I've proposed is four domains, and each user has their own personal domain with a shadow stack for sandboxing, and I'll describe what I mean. So here's my first acknowledgement of let's let's kind of work with what we have today as opposed to changing everything. The logical address space is 128 bits, but the upper 32 bits are not used. That's like the IA64 today until Sandy Cove, it was 64 bits, but only 48 was used. Now 57 is used. So the notion of having a bigger space with, with unused bits has been around for 20 years, so there's nothing innovative there. And what I've done is to say certain objects, and there's a field that says object types, say kernel object, and I'll, you'll see why that's relevant, tells you it's a byte offset for 64 bits or 32 bits. It's a PCAS. That means you do something else with the address because it, it's external, reserved, et cetera. And I'm gonna kind of go into what these all mean and how that works. It also, you may have an object that says it's encrypted. So one of the things, um, with various organizations I work with, I'll go into it, they say, we'd like to know that objects can be encrypted. Or an object says, to access this, you need a two-factor authorization. You know, stuff like that. So we can refer to that as late binding. Okay, now get into the details. So the first thing is, this doesn't show up here, like, let's see. Okay. If I have a 64-bit RV address, I get mapped it into a 128-bit address. I did this in 1978 when I did 16 bits to 32 bits. What that means is I can run a 64-bit a.out or a 32-bit a.out for that matter. In an inner domain that's not used, I translate that 32 or 64-bit pointer 228 bit pointer, and now I can carry it along, and the kernel only sees 196 bit pointers. So here is a four level page table for 48 bit address space. And let me tell you, you really want to make a presentation and want it to be successful to draw this stuff. So, one reason to get away from a five level page table is the issue of drawing it. And in 4KB, et cetera. But what I've done is replaced it with an object that's indexed into a from a register into a table, and the table has various entries. And again, I was told this is what the current Linux kernel has basically in, uh, for PROC IDs. And inside that object, I have the following table. One thing control bits, but it says, what is the physical, what kind of addressing, and what's the address of the first level page table? So if you're doing hypervisor, virtual machine management, the guest OS is creating its own page table entry, 
but that's a throwaway. It's the hypervisor created page table. Well, since this object in this table is created by the hypervisor, you get exactly the page table and the structure you want by, uh, for that object. You also have a bounds check. All references are going to bounds check. And I, I'll show you later that uh, Google pointed out that something like 44% of all kernel errors would do to, uh, could be detected by bounds check. And then to further support hypervisor, you have a system-wide virtual address space, even though it's not part of the user, that's 64 bits. And when you're in hypervisor mode, you can generate a, uh, you can create, if you want a TLB that doesn't have to be flush, et cetera. So you have a bounds check. What kind of page size? What's What's the page size page table entries? That is, it doesn't have to, one object could be a 4KB page, another one could be a one megabyte page. It doesn't have to be for the whole process. First level of data protection, unique TLB naming. So that's, that's one, again, the best benchmark is the one the competition can't run or whatever. So that means for multi-user, multi-process, this is faster and it's more secure. The permission bits in a page table entry are read, write, execute. Then you have what I call the personal domain shadow stack permission bits. This is under user control. You call a routine and you, the user, say what this routine can read in my address space and it creates its own stack. Domain switching, when I want to go one domain to another, again, I did this 50 years ago. 40 years ago, is I have an instruction that says call domain, whatever, two calls three, and the entry does a bounds check. Am I allowed to do that? And if I, and if I am, I switch domains. And a domain table entry says where I start, I cannot directly reference a starting location. And it tells me whether or not that domain for that entry can be called. So I have permission bits in this domain entry that say, if I'm calling in, in this current, in the domain I'm calling, can the caller get to me to further, further mediate? So what was a 3D matrix is now a 64-bit number. Comparison with RV64. Again, another Dilbert. And this is what I mean. We have to innovate to cannibalize. Someone once asked me, what's, why do startups succeed, besides the fact that people are more motivated perhaps and smarter, is a startup generally starts with no legacy. You start from scratch, or at least the, the most successful ones. So there's a lot to say about starting from scratch because you don't worry about this customer base. And I once looked at even my own company after a while, 20% of the time of the best kernel guys were dealing, kernel people, sorry, were dealing with maintenance and support as opposed to coming up with innovative ways to provide new features. So this rather Dilbert thing sort of captures that, but we can execute a 64-bit code, map it to 128-bit code, systems calls are mediated, and most importantly, you can use 64 utilities to develop SV128 images. Okay, personal stack, personal domain. Um, again, you can read it. The whole idea is to deal with heap overflows, writing over stack, etc. Again, I'm gonna put this in the hardware and it's up to the user to support this. Go ahead. I'm curious about that, because this comes up all the time. So this means that I can, in some sense, subclass these permissions on my address space without involving the kernel. That's out, yeah, the question was, that means I can subclass permissions in my own address space without involving the kernel. Correct. And the reason I did that is, uh, well, first of all, it makes sense. But secondly, for example, email Trojan horses and stuff like that. Yeah. If I say, 
if I click on a link that gets executed in a shadow domain that only has read access and no system calls. Yeah. There you go. I'm, I'm not, I'm oversimplifying it, but. Yeah, no, I wonder how something like uh, you know, future level schedulers and spreading. It might be a little overhead way for me to for protect me, to protect my little user level thread, like the Go, Go routine, all the other Go routines. Right. Without having the, the heavy hammer of the, the kernel request, but further, because the kernel doesn't know your little user level. That's right. In fact, that you bring up a good point is, and this is a point of discussion. Do we permit the user or should we permit the user with the right feature set for him or her to establish their own protection environment? And for some, yes. Yeah. In a sense, we have it today in a, in a rather bizarre way of if I execute an antivirus detector, that doesn't involve the kernel. That's some user willing to pay the money or have this thing intercept, you know, all downloads, et cetera. But, you know, that, but that's correct. So anyway, this is a pictorial of how the shadow stock works. The benefits, now what's the whole purpose of this? Logical address is 96 bits. The bounds check, uh, there's a reference that 44% of all kernel, Android kernel bugs are missing or incorrect bounds. So that's one benefit, more reliable Android kernel. It's a system-wide TLB. You have direct support of PCAST-like addressing of course clusters. And you have a common virtual address of different ISAs. So I go back to the Stan Williams chart of open architecture, Different ISAs sharing a common global address space. Different question, because one, one thing I always liked about the data general AOS was that every virtual address and every process was unique. That's correct. Whereas in the Unix model, we all have the same virtual address meaning different things. Okay, AOS is the data general operating system that was built on the MV8000 to begin with. And without getting to the details, I was part and parcel of the design and operating system because it was my hardware. I hate to say it that way, but it was. Yeah. And when we sat down with the people, with a group of about five people, we said, okay, we have to support 16-bit binaries on 32-bit. It's irrelevant. It could be 64 on 128, 32 on 64. We want to segregate out the address space because it's in hardware. It doesn't cost you anything. And since half the team there had come, were either come or influenced by Multics, it wasn't difficult to uh, make that argument. Now, I'm not trying to say that makes it good, but yeah, but a lot of the model we have today is driven by literally by the limits of PDP 11, right? That's because correct. Have the same small 16 bit range, whereas in this model. Like I said, yeah, uh, for good or for bad, and I'm going to say this again. If I didn't go through this before, yeah. I couldn't have come up with, I won't say a simplification, but something that's rational. Yeah. Where uh, FS was irrational. FHP was irrational. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, say lobby. But the, the other key point here is this. You don't need plus TLB because you don't have alias virtual address. Correct. That's kind of the big point. And that is really a dramatic break with and the, one, the, the model of Linux, which right. inherited it from the model of Unix, which inherited it. And, and the one thing I know a lot, a lot about is implementing hardware to support protection and virtual address translation. Yeah. To me, it's, it's just rolling off my back. Sorry about that. But okay. No. So now we get down to current day, which has nothing to do with address space. You know, it all got started with Spectre, Meltdown. Uh, there was a very interesting paper uh, from uh, my, uh, Google that I reference uh, later on. And basically, this notion of microstate. 
that we have mach programmer visible state, you know, instructions, um, registers. We have all this other state that the programmer doesn't see unless you're evil. And the last six months have been a lot of talk about evil. Well, well evil or not, let's just say doing things you shouldn't be doing. And I find this interesting because uh, sometimes in my spare time, I do this for grins. And it's actually very easy if you understand hardware design. And, and if you're luck lucky enough to have a logic analyzer sometimes to look at bus transactions. So let's look at secure logic design. This is just as easily be applicable to an IA64 or any other machine. So the first thing we have is at some point, we want to use formal method compilers. I want to make sure I say that. For all this hardware, if we write crappy code, garbage in, garbage out. And we should try to do development with formal compilers where they verify things. And I provide a reference to that. The next thing is Linux came out with this called Kaiser proposal out of a uh, university of, uh, in Austria. I forgot which one. And it shows their solution to the notion of uh, Spectre. So let's see what this means. Oh, here's my other thing, which could be very controversial if you're in, a, depending on what company you're in. That I'd rather have N minus K secure core. N minus K secure cores is better than N, N insecure cores. Now, when you say, well, but you're going to have only 28, not 32, well, probably doesn't make much difference in performance. And if you ha if those 28 were secure, that means you may not have in the bad press that now we have to go back and patch 1 billion cores or firmware because I found the security violation. So the other thing some people asked me to include was encrypted memory. Now, this is a poor man's encryption. This is not with AES or whatever. And what I did is, by doing things with inversion and scramble, so it's easy to encrypt and decrypt in hardware, for certain applications, this is sufficient, not for long-term storage. And the, the example I use is the Enigma, for those who saw it, the program with Turing and what he did in World War II, where his goal was he had to decrypt within 24 hours because every day he got the communications that says where tomorrow there's going to be a bombing raid. So if the German encryption took two days to decrypt, his thing wouldn't have worked. So that, that's an example of certain things that are time dependent. The reason I did this because it's cheap to implement and for certain applications it works. Shadow cache, this, again, these are all things that could be done any instruction set, it is where I do this speculation and I put things in the shadow cache. And unfortunately, the current designs is part of the coherency domain. And I can, with various side channels and detect what's, what's here. The point is a shadow cache should not be part of the coherency mechanisms. And the state of the micro cache only should be the commit. The reason I show this is that means if I do this and add extra memory, this is an example of why I may go from 32 cores to 28 cores, 32. Branch injection. Again, you can read it. The way to handle this is create, like if I want to have a four level deep cache, create extra levels to do the speculation. And if I don't take the speculation, I don't change the original micro state. It always comes back to, you do not want to change the microstate during speculation. I'm oversimplifying it, but that's common. Spectre, I took this from a presentation. This is sort of what started a lot of things off six months to a year ago. Again, you speculate. And the reason you read this is even though you're not supposed to, it's a flat address space. So unless you go to the page table entries, you don't know you're allowed to read it. That's, that's the issue. And the key here is, is 
This is what Kaiser did. They said, if what you're going to speculate is, a, let's say, a different object or out of your address space, you don't speculate. You stop. You don't try to make something faster. That's not necessary. And then the microstate, the Google paper said, if, if necessary, you want an instruction that says no speculation, not defense instruction. Meltdown is where you pass a bogus pointer to the kernel, where you, the user passes a, a pointer to the kernel that's actually a kernel pointer. And the reason I find this interesting is hypothetically in 1979, a couple of people may have done this to a vax. And uh, because it was a flat address space, they didn't take that into account. It didn't happen on a DG equipment, thank God. But what this is, is I'm a user, I pass a pointer that's a kernel pointer. And if I don't check on it, I'm going to reference my own data set because I'm allowed to do it because I'm in the kernel. So, um, again, you can read this stuff. Way back when, we used to call it Trojan horse pointers, you know, from Helen to Troy. And today I call it, beware, rather than beware of Greeks bearing gifts, beware of geeks bearing jits in a more contemporary manner. So that would be consistent with shadow domains. Summary, this is a good time. This has to be compared to Sherry. They've done a lot of interesting work in Cambridge. It's a, it's a capability-based system. Um, it's also a good summary of why you want a single address space in the paper that came out of University of Washington. If I wanted to do this, could probably be a 15, 20 page paper, you know, with references, but uh, that's not me. Um, should internet addressing be by UID, not IP address? There was actually a study at MIT on that by Zhang and Estrin. And what next? So we're now in the process of trying to develop a plan to do further emulation with FPGAs or, or whatever. Um, and just lastly, uh, again, going back to uh, Dilbert, the PowerPoint can change the entire company's strategy. The rest of the you have to copy us and that could change the entire world. Someone has been having delusions of effectiveness. <laughs> and maybe that's what this is. But that's what they said to, several times in my career, that's what they said to me. And they uh, had to bite the bullet. Okay. Acknowledgement, the people who helped me, Press Winters, who got, got me started on this, Dave Clark at MIT. My son is Dan Wallach, who some of you may or may not know, uh, does a lot of se computer security. Gentleman in Micron, John Lydell, who's done a lot of PCAST stuff, and Steve Poole of Lanel, who some of you may know. He has an extensive set of references. I'm not going to go through it. And that's it. Thank you. So, people, please feel free to ask any question you like. So the, the ultimate idea that uh, you mentioned, do you think that you're going to have trouble with only 64 bits at some point that we, uh, we don't have enough to do distributed allocation? Or okay, the question is, uh, do you think 64-bit object ID is enough? I thought about that. I mean, that, that's a fair question. And um, certainly, uh, th just because the IPv6 people did that, because it's 64 bits, all that says is, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong with a lot of other people who are a lot smarter than me. <laughs> OK. And uh, One can philosophize is how long is an architecture good for, whatever good for means. Typically it's 20, 30 years. I mean, if, if you look at, you know, 16 bits to 32 bits to 64, IA32 when they expand the thing, 20 to 30 years is kind of you know, comfortable. And I think in 20, for 20 to 30 years, that, that's fine. 20 years from now, maybe my granddaughter will come up with something else. But that's a fair question, and um, it, 
I feel I'm in good company, at least going, it's a power of two. You know, I'm not trying to, and yes, I've had people, this was one of the issues with FHP is it actually only had a 32-bit offset, a 96-bit object because they felt, well, we're going, and it had other attributes. And I'm going, in that case, that wasn't someone else's design. I mean, design, we got there, but if someone else made the suggestion, very, very, very smart person. But I think for the next 20 years, 128 bits will solve the problems that we have. 64 bits came out nominally 95, 96, you know, depending on whether it was Sun or HP. Okay. So, and so that says it's 25 years, you know, so I at least have a point for 25 years that lit that lasted. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, I passed over that. I can go back, but basically, to if you really wanted to do it, I'll, I can bring up the slide. You have to have a domain server just like DNS. And this is why a lot of people do or do not like it. So if I want to go back to the presentation, that's an appropriate question. Why doesn't come up? Oh, let's see. Okay. Excuse me for a second. I went over because it scares people. <laughs> But I, this directly answers your question. So think of it this way. We have a, a central unified unique server for IPv6, for URLs, for phones, right? The reason my phone number is unique is some organization up in the sky says country code 01 is the United States, yada, yada, yada. So we, we have an existence proof of those organizations, of that capability. So to create unique objects, there you go. So now the question is, most people don't even know that the, what a DNS server is. This is only upon the allocation. Once it's allocated, you don't have to go back again. Yes. Yes. The question is, that means there would be a local cache to, to maintain the persistent created UIDs, if I can use that term. Yes, that, that's correct. And when I put this down, I'm kind of going, uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I have it, but I skipped over it because I know some people, will, wait a second. Does that mean Big Brother's going to look at all my programs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I know, I know. Yes, you're right. And depending on my mood of the day and who I'm speaking to, I either get, wow, that's great. We can do ABC. And no, no way, Jose, are we going to. And you, can, you could probably argue among yourselves to see the pros and cons of that. But that, that's a fair statement. And that's why I said, let's drop out to 96 bits where at least I don't get into this argument. Okay, there, we have this online question thing. I do have one question. I, I sent you the paper, by the way, the question of references. It's Postius, I will say it wrong, Sarah Briani. Um, quote, uh, fat pointers is a long-term bet. They use too much RAM and don't solve use after free unless there is some additional mechanism for capability revocation. 
Can we have something sooner? E.g. memory tagging in 64-bit RISC-5. And any references to paper um, that he had in ISECCON 18? And again, I sent it to you, so I thought you might want to... Okay, well, that. look. Revocation, I did have slides on revocation, is... Okay, let's... I think I heard two questions, but yeah. if, if a point that goes from 64 to 128, it uses more memory. I don't care, you know, if you're gonna have an address, even if it's a flat address bigger than 64 bits, it's gonna be 128 bits as opposed to 80 bits, in my humble opinion. And to me, this is as Yogi Berra in New York, deja vu all over again. This is what happened when we went from 16 bits to 32 bits, 32 bits to 64 bits. In 1982, when we ported lit, uh, BSD to my first company, um, uh, Convex, there was all these issues of what's a 16-bit pointer, what's a 32-bit pointer, and in C, what's a default pointer size. And we, we have to fess up to it. The pointer is going to go up. Memory is getting denser and cheaper. This is not like you're going against the trend, okay? So... Again, this is where the Dilbert slide about breaking, you know, sometimes we have to be, go back. And that's why I, I say we have to have a, a way of doing RV64 binaries, 128 machine. So that's one part. The capability part, it's, it's almost a semi-religious issue in the sense of, yes, you don't necessarily need as many tables, but if I want to revoke it, I got to go find where this capability is. Where if it's in the table, oh, object 533 indexed into the table, your history, you're gone. Okay. And we could spend an hour, we could have a whole separate hour discussion on the pros and cons of that to be candid. Okay. So you said memory is getting bigger to justify the larger pointers, but it's not really getting faster or faster at size. Because I know there are some platforms where, for example, compiling the 32 bit mode makes benchmark run faster than compiling the 64 bit mode. Okay. And I believe that's largely because of the reduced memory usage. Okay. The, the question is more memory, to, you may have more memory, but it, your program may run slower because now you're fetching, let's say, 64 bits versus 32 bits or whatever. That's fair having built machines, but. If the answer to that is I build a 128-bit bus versus a 64-bit bus, done. I mean, again, you're speaking to a person, you tell me a problem. Oh, I know how to fix that, 128-bit bus, next. But that's going to cost $3.85 more per chip. You want the capability or you don't want the capability? You know, all you have to do is be in a computer manufacturer. And this is all tr this is true for all of them. You have a security bug and Intel comes out and says, oh my God, we're gonna make everything run five, pre whatever the percentage is slower because we have to change the firmware or the microcode to deal with something. It's sort of, you pay me now or pay me later. And um, uh, it depends on who you are. If you're producing an IO internet of thing chip that your concern is going to go from 50 cents to 55 cents. I'll buy your argument, okay? If I'm running my company on a $10 million cluster and, I'm, and I want it to be secure, I'll go to the 128 chip. Look at what happened to Experian. Facebook just happened. They didn't encrypt a database. What's it, what would have been worth to them if Encryption was part of the inherent architecture as opposed to someone forgot to do, who knows what they forgot to do, but didn't, didn't do something. That's what you have to think about. At least that's what I think about. But again, when I go back, we had the same argument going from 16 bits to 32 bits. We made the buses wider. 
we created the interfaces. Some people now say that we're going to go to optical interfaces. So we don't have this issue of 64 to 128 or whatever. And uh, I come at this of building supercomputers. And when I built those computers, that argument, that lasted one second. What do you mean? We're going to make this thing as fast as possible. We're going to have 6,420-bit data paths. And they want, to, they want to run the simulation in one hour. That's what it costs. End of story. I don't mean to, but it's who's your market and what's the application. But that's a, that's a fair question to ask. Okay, it's one more question or are we done? Please. When you talk about the shadow cache outside of the memory, do you envision them to be completely transparent to the programmer? Or like totally transparent. My view is the microstate, if it's a microstate, has to be totally transparent. Totally, can say it again. And the hardware has to have mechanisms that when that shadow state, I don't care for whatever reason, specter, meltdown, coherency, um, um, you, you have to now have in the machine something known, you're in a speculative state, you know, that's, as opposed to you're not. And when you're in a speculative state and you do not take the speculation, I'm trying to be, you void it. And then you as a manufacturer, remember this is independent of the address space, has to say, do I want to increase my chip size by 5%? I'll pick a number that gives it more secure. And I'll let you answer the question. Think of, I know it doesn't sound right, but think of all the press that happened when these issues came up and all the manufacturers said, oh, we've got to go back and do this or We'll have a patch in a month, you know, stuff you read in the paper. What's it worth not to have that? Then the flip side is if you're a company, like for example, we I'm talking about Rowhammer. I work for a memory company. They actually put features there to that eliminate Rowhammer. So you can actually buy, let's say loosely for this discussion, a Rohammer impervious DRAM. But if you're a bad guy, if you're a good guy and concerned about a bad guy, that that's a requirement. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the invitation. Cameron, I think that's it for the recording. Okay, well, thank you very much. Let me just shut this down. At some point when this becomes, I understand, a YouTube video, I don't, I don't know if I, you'll give me the link or? Yeah, it's still. I can't tell if that means it's still recording. I'll switch it. I think it's I'll switch it off now. It just cut it, I guess. Okay, you you fix it or so oh yeah, the the red button, the red one? I think. Yeah. Oh. I thought I didn't know we controlled that. So oh, oh. apparently we don't. <laughs> Keeps for